Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Well, recently I returned to my hometown in Penang, which, as you might or might not know, is a near-perfect haven for folks who dream of a good work-life balance. What retirement seekers might not know, however, is that Penang is a major player in the global semiconductor industry. It has been so since the 1960s, when our leaders at the time, the then Chief Minister, Tun Dr. Lim chong Yu, was able to attract the likes of Intel, National Semiconductor, uh, Hewlett-Packard and, and Bosch to invest in Penang. Well, with the success of smartphones, EVs and the internet, Penang is booming and even more so recently after the state became a beneficiary of the US-China trade battle with billions of investment directed to my hometown. But like in many parts of the world, Penang is painfully short of skilled engineers thanks to a combination of factors, whether political, domestic, even global. And these factors will be spelt out by my next guest, a gentleman named Dato Sri S.H. Wong, himself a veteran of the semiconductor industry and also a veteran of Intel Penang, where he spent nearly three decades in the business. His last position was as Vice President of Technology and Manufacturing and also General Manager of Assembly and Test Manufacturing, responsible for all assembly test factories worldwide, which makes him really, really experienced and really, really knowledgeable of the industry. As always, do please subscribe to the Do More podcast if you haven't yet already. Uh, leave a constructive comment in the box below. Like, share, etc. You know the drill. And so now, dear viewers, may I present my next guest, Dr. Sri S.H. Wong. <laughs> Dr. Sri, thank you for doing this. Um, look, I've known each other, we've known each other a long time, since I think the 90s, when I was a print reporter covering you. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always known you to be one of the key players in the Malaysian semiconductor space. Uh, you have a very long career with Intel, one of the key players. Um, I just want to say that going forward, I think you've always been kind of one of the biggest ambassadors for the Malaysian electronics industry. What should we know about who Dr. Sri SH Wong is? I joined the industry in uh, 1976, January. So. Uh, by the time I retired, it was uh, about 27 years in Intel and then plus another couple of years with Dell. And the, my last job before retirement is a vice president of Intel for the assembly test operations worldwide. So I was covering uh, like five countries around the world, but I was the first in Intel to be based in Malaysia doing this job. Because most of the time, all this job the people have to be based in the us so i was flying a lot you know covering the various countries so in the 70s you have been obviously um, working at the time that Tun long lim chong yu was in charge chief minister yes. you would have met andy group a few times you would have met gordon moore even at the end of his career um what made those people special in terms of setting up penang as what it is well, the story has said that because when I joined, the factory has already started. You know, I joined that time when the factory, I was told, was burned down in May 1975. So when I joined, a lot of people asked me, why are you joining this factory? Like, going to close, you know? It's a reef. They said this industry is fly by night. But, you know, I, I continued and never looked back. Yes, it has been growing. Andy Grove uh, came here uh, to look at the land and his car was stuck in the mud because the day that before it was raining heavily. So when they showed him the land with these all coconut trees, uh, his car was stuck and yet he invested in this uh, in Penang. So that is... Really? Did he see in Penang those days? I think uh, from what I understand is that number one, he was very impressed with the people that he met. Okay, he met the chief minister, he met the people all around him, including people in the restaurant. So, and he was very impressed with the level of English and with the level of mathematics that we had. So uh, I guess that is one of the key differentiators that probably made him decide that this is the place to come. And of course, at that time, our cost was lower compared to the US. Yeah, so they were looking for a lower cost location. But it is a leap of faith because we didn't have anything. We have only shown him the land that is coconut plantation. And he said, yeah, this is a place I'm, I'm coming. Uh, in terms of one of the founders is uh, Gordon Moore, right? And yeah. Gordon Moore is famous for Moore's Law, which yes. is the law of uh, computing doubling in power yeah. every, every, in, every in eight months, months right? to 24 hours. Right. Yeah. So Moore's Law held true for at least a couple of decades until I think recently when the Moore's yes. Law has yes. just been... So can you talk about that? Yeah, basically... Uh, 
Gordon Moore uh, predicted that the number of transistors in the chip will double every 18 months to 24 months. Okay, and that we held true until very recently. Okay, where the uh, technology node is getting smaller and smaller. Okay, and in my whole history uh, working in Intel, everybody tell me that we're going to reach a limit. But after another decade, we never reached. Other another decade, we didn't reach the limit until uh, probably now. You know, where they are finding different solutions. You know, more than more and so on uh, solutions to to keep all this. Uh, uh, intensity of transistors and performance together. Yeah, so um, in the last 10 to 15, in fact, years, I think in financial markets, lah, there's really been only essentially five to 10 companies that have really driven the share markets, the S&P 500, NASDAQ, to new levels. Yes. And those are the ones known as the Magnificent Seven, yeah. the Amazons, the Googles, the Facebooks, yeah. the Metas, the NVIDIAs recently, the last three years. Mm -hmm. And then NVIDIA is really a overtaken right mm -hmm. now that market cap is I think only second to Microsoft and Apple. Mm -hmm. They keep on changing yes. places yeah. up yeah. to yeah. And it's all about artificial intelligence and really it is the chips in NVIDIA that mm -hmm. NVIDIA makes mm -hmm. that are seen to be the next stage of computing. Yeah. Can you talk to me if, or, as, as a layman mm -hmm. should I understand what I think? The, the first thing is that the uh, world is driven by data. Okay, then use of data is tremendous, it's growing every year. And they have to figure out how do you process all this data and how do you analyze the data. And so when uh, NVIDIA came out with the GPU and with AI, then that makes it even more attractive that you can analyze a huge amount of data in a very short possible time. You know, So uh, that need for AI, uh, that need for high computing uh, power, uh, is very needed in this uh, current situation. So that drives the growth of the semiconductor currently. So what is the difference between an NVIDIA chip and an Intel chip? Well, NVIDIA chip is a GPU. It is a graphics graphic processing, processing unit versus a CPU. Intel is CPU. They don't really have a GPU, even though they have AI functionality. So the uh, currently, the GPU seems to be performing it at a higher performance. So, what should a layman know about GPU versus CPU? Oh, I don't know how to answer this question. <laughs> it's a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit technical for me, lah. Okay, I don't want to mislead them, but uh, I just leave it, Okay, okay. So I understand. I think CPU is just processing power yeah. for computing uh, processes. Yes. GPU is for things like video and 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 graphics, graphics and all that, lah. And you need both of them in one machine to, yes. to perform right. at a very high level. Yes. 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 You need them both, yeah. Correct. In the, in the, let's say in the service. So the electronics industry in Malaysia is really, I, I think the, the big player in Malaysian electronics is Penang and Northern Region. Yeah. And of course, driven by Intel and all the other players since then, Western Digital and Magellan and all these other guys, right? Um, what I do know is that there's not enough people here to fill the need for engineers. Yeah. First of all, what kind of engineers? And second of all, why the shortage of talent? Yeah. You know, um, if you look back at the growth of the semiconductor, you know, the semiconductor is growing tremendously. So if you look at Malaysia in 2021, uh, we grew 18%. 2022, we grew 30%. At that time, uh, our Malaysia. export value, Malaysia, Malaysia, our export value is about 593 billion. So for Penang, it is about 55 to 60% of that value. And not only that, one more time. Mm -hmm. So in 2022, it was 593 billion ringgit. Ringgit. Yeah, export that's, value. That's maybe about 120 billion US dollars. Ah, right? uh, yes. In export value export from value. Malaysia in three, two years ago. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And Penang is more than half. Yeah. Penang is more than half. Probably 55 percent or even as higher. Okay. Uh, and then not only that, we were attracting a lot of high quality companies, you know, uh, Intel announced a 7.1 billion US dollars investment. Uh, Infineon announced a 5 billion euro investment in their silicon carbide fab. AT&S, which is substrate, announced 1.7 billion euro. So many, many companies were announcing all kinds of investment over the last two to three years. Even recently also, there are announcements of investment in the country. So growth, Plus investments like this will attract uh, will attract the need for technical people, especially engineers. So that's why uh, 
we are saying that we need all these engineers to support the growth. So you look at the uh, global growth, the global growth uh, is projecting to be 1 trillion by 2030. In 2022, it was 574 billion US. So 2030, so 1 trillion, global number, right? global, global number. So for Malaysia to keep up, and Malaysia now today is ranked six exporter of the world, 13% capacity of uh, assembly tests in Malaysia, and 7% of global trade flows through Malaysia. If we just want to keep up where we are doing, you know, we need to grow to about 1.2 trillion. To do that, you know, we need uh, resources. So if you look at today's number, the number of headcount that are in the semiconductor and electronics industry is about 618,000 people working in this industry. If you say you're going to double to 1.2 trillion, theoretically, you should be doubling the headcount. But we expect because of productivity, AI, smart manufacturing, and all that new technology, you will probably need 300,000 people, out of which we need about 60,000 technical people. Which are engineers? Uh, mainly engineers. Okay, so you need about, after taking the account of mm. the robots and the machines that mm. can take the place of people, yes. you still need about 300,000 people, of which about 20% of them are engineers, or 60, yeah. 60,000. Yes. Right? What kind of skills are these engineers doing? So the engineers are uh, varied skills. It depends on the, com the uh, company you are working in. So, for example, you have an IC design, then you need engineers in the electronics, uh, microelectronics design, uh, and have good understanding of circuitry and so on. The foundation need to be there. If you are in a factory, then you need the ability to problem solve and understand product engineering, the product, the process, the equipment, and try to solve manufacturing problems. You know, whether it is a yield problem or it is a defect why you have a defect and all that. And then you have materials uh, scientists who need to understand materials when, when you have problems with materials and there are different classification. You know, you have software, you have mechanical engineers in charge of uh, equipment and uh, some of them need to do packaging development. Then you have a mixture of different engineering knowledge from materials to uh, uh, <clears throat> physics, chemistry, all in one trying to figure out you know, what is the best way to uh, package a product. So we have different skills required. So it makes it not so easy to say that, oh yeah, I need so many engineers, but then if your engineer's skill set is not related to what the company is looking for, then it's not good enough. So FAP, for example, they may not need too many of electronics engineers. They may need more material science people, chemistry, physics, uh, rather than just pure electronics. So you have mechanical for the equipment and you have the others, you know, uh, you have chemical engineers who are needed in the fab, with a fab, uh, factories. So it's a wide range, uh, it's a wide range. So that's why it's not so easy for a university to say, oh, I come up with this engineer, therefore you will be able to do cater for the whole industry. So as it stands now, mm -hmm. uh, July 2024, uh, mm -hmm. um, we have a shortage roughly of how many thousand engineers in Penang? Uh, right now, the uh, shortage is more is not so acute, but it was only acute on specific uh, uh, skill sets or technical skill sets. So, for example, IC design. If you want to grow, you need really te uh, technical people, and uh, most of the companies look for. Uh, graduates who are 3.5 and above, a CGP of 3.5 and above. Uh, so if you are not there, chances you'll not be hired for IC design. For manufacturing, then they'll be looking for maybe a 3.3, even lower to 3. They, they can train you to, to uh, do that. And then they have other types of engineers where they are looking for people with good enough a technical foundation and then at the same time have the resourcefulness and the positive attitude to learn and acquire knowledge along the way. So which one comes first? The supply of the people and the utilities and the inputs, then the investments, or the investment and then the people and so on and so forth, which leads the charge? Because you just said there's a lot of companies that have invested in Penang, right? Yeah. But then they come in and they find, oh, not enough people. Yeah. So, so what, what's, what's okay. the situation here? Okay, the situation is like this. We have the talent and the experienced people in the company, in the country. Okay, so when a company come to invest here, they will look around the whole, they'll survey the whole country and say, okay, do you have the talent to support me? That's number one. 
do you have the ecosystem to support me? All, all the companies who can do machining, service, whatever, can you support the company? Can you build the building that I want? Can you have contractors, architect, all that here to deliver the outcome of the uh, building? And then, of course, they look at the uh, government and the laws, and then they look at whether the government is uh, friendly enough to help them through. So generally, they will come here because of that. And not only that, uh, when you have big investment like Intel, we've been here for 50 years and, and uh, Infineon, we've been here for 40 years or so. Uh, why do they continue to put in such huge investment? It's because the talents here have delivered the results for the last 50 years or 40 years that they were looking for. So the confidence level is high on the talent to deliver. So when we say we are short of talent, are they available? Yes, they are available. Okay. So what happened to, to, to this new investment is that when they come here, they hire so-called a few critical experienced engineers and then the rest they will hire so-called less experienced or new fresh uh, uh, graduates to join the company. And then train them up. Right? And then train them up. So there are different levels of uh, hiring. So now when you pull all these people from the industry, you know, you don't really feel it. Because you take a few from here, a few from there, a few from here, and you, by the time you put the team together, you form the team already that they can, you know, can deliver. But what is happening is that, so where is the impact? Okay, when the, this company pull engineers from all in the uh, community, from other companies, the other companies who have holes already will take the next level. And when you come to the next level, it's mainly the Malaysian uh, SME, so to speak. So they are the one in the final analysis you know, lose more engineers to all these big boys, you know, and they have to start now trying to hire engineers to fill up that, that hole that has been created. So to fill up that hole, you need supply. And where is the supply? Okay, the supply has to come from many, many uh, areas. One is you have to train uh, maybe the technicians, you know, to a diploma level, and then from there you take them in and continue training them. All right, so most of the SME will be doing that because they can't hire engineers, therefore I'll take a diploma guy and I'll train him. And then over the next few years, they, they can become engineers. But however, what we are trying to tell the government to do is to follow the strategy of other countries because with such huge investment that are coming in, with so huge expansion that's happening in the country, the shortage will be there. Not this year because the, uh, the demand is not quite there yet and it's coming back gradually to the second half of the year. But I think next year, uh, there will be uh, more competition for talent to be hired. And so if you use other countries' talent with the strategy used, strategy used by Singapore, by US and many other countries around the world, uh, we should follow their strategy and start with hiring engineers or technical students studying in Malaysia, a foreign student studying in Malaysia as a start. Let them work in Malaysia. You know, that's what US has been doing and that's what uh, Singapore has been doing. They're using a lot of our talent, as you know, you know uh, out of, I think, 1.8 million uh, people who have uh, migrated from the country. I think the data says about 1.2 are in Singapore. Well, from what I read, Malaysia doesn't do a good job of offering this avenue of employment to the foreign grads. They are mm. basically told to come here, study and then leave. Is that right? Uh, well, the, uh, the, our policy is not as clear as it should be that you're allowed to work here. If you're allowed to work here, it means that if a company wants to hire you and you apply for a visa, then you should get that uh, permit to work here. But it's not as straightforward because it's not clear. You know, there's no, the, the policy say yes, but then it is not like uh, a very specific policy, which the government, I think, is now evaluating to make it a clear policy. Can you hire? You say yes, then it's easy to go through the uh, immigration and get your employment pass, uh, get your... Well, this is not a new industry, right? Not a industry, right? Yes. It's been around since the 70s, as yes. you say. Yeah. Why don't we have a clear policy yeah. after yeah. essentially 60 years? So one of the concerns government has is that if you hire too many of these foreign engineers, so to speak, uh, then you're depriving Malaysians of a job. But then we have reached a stage whereby it is not depriving Malaysian of jobs. We are actually going to create more jobs. So today you hire 50 engineers, tomorrow, next year, you hire another 100. And year after that could be 300. So you are growing. 
right? So you're not really depriving them, you're actually creating more jobs for, for the future. So that's where I think uh, government need to understand. And specifically, not which, an issue, yeah. which ministry is involved here? Is it domestic trade, is it MIT, is it MADA? I think there are many uh, ministries involved. You have uh, MOHR, you have uh, Ministry of Home Affairs, you have MITI. Uh, I think these are the main ones, I think. Uh, so because we've got several ministries working on yes. this, yes. is it true? Is it fair to say that no one really knows who is responsible and so they keep on uh, asking the a lot? No, I think that's not a fair statement. I think they know. It's just a matter of uh, making it into a clear policy. And then when, when do you think we can expect to uh, see yeah. such charity? I don't know. We've been trying. <laughs> We've been trying. Ho hopefully in the next uh, year or so. So the thing is, um, what we have with these names that you mentioned, Infineon, yeah. you know, Bosch, of course, mm -hmm. Intel, um, these, are, these are industries which haven't really led the charge in terms of increase in, in value yeah. or, or, you know, this is not exactly cutting edge per se. Yeah. Um, we don't necessarily see Jensen Huang coming to measure, to yeah. study the possibility of opening an NVIDIA plant. We don't really see the possibility mm -hmm. of Elon Musk, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, of, of Elon Musk coming here to open a, a new factory for his Cybertrucks or BYD for, for that matter. Or, or am I wrong? Will, will that be a possibility down the line? Uh, everything is a possibility. I think uh, for NVIDIA, they are mainly doing development and all the manufacturing are done in other countries like Taiwan. Okay, huh. So they don't really say, have, say per se a factory to, to start. Uh, but however, they were here, Jensen Wong was here, which we talked about the YTL uh, data center that they were going to support. Uh, Elon Musk was here, I think, uh, to talk about the EV. Uh, you know, but the EV side then, the thing, key thing that we are going to do is to assemble the, yes, the EV so cars. So it's not quite different, it's quite different from the development aspect. Correct. And he said that he will set up uh, all the charging stations or something, Correct. yeah. So data centers are data centers and it's not yeah. exactly new technology mm -hmm. and you do need a lot of power and cheap power to mm -hmm. drive data centers, mm -hmm. right? Which of course is yeah. something that Malaysia has yeah. like, because we've got excess power. Mm -hmm. and then of course when it comes to assembling cars, assembling cars is not exactly R&D or mm -hmm. new technology yeah, stuff, yeah, it's just yeah. assembly, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in, in summation, it's, it's generally low, middle mm -hmm. tech, yeah. so yeah. not low yes. middle yeah. tech, right? Relatively, like, relatively, relatively, relatively because yeah, tech, like. because you have to uh, learn how to Correct. assemble the car number one, yes. and then they are hopefully uh, involve engineers to do some minor adjustment or design Correct. as they find problems and so on, and then you learn about the battery, yeah. you know how it's all put together and so on. So there are some learning, but that is a good start to hopefully go up the value chain. Yeah. So do you think that Malaysia will? Malaysia has the has the policy and the politicians and the people to you know perhaps populate these industries down the line. Uh, I think it's possible if the Malaysia plan for it because uh, let's say in the EV. So what is the what are the things that Malaysia can play with? You know, I mean, if you talk about all the body parts, the battery is all done already. So the area maybe Malaysia can play will be the components, IC components, you know, or the sensors. And if you can develop some of this for the EV cars, then that will be good. So if you compare the number of chips used in an uh, internal combustion engine, it's about 1,500. And in the EV, it's more than 3,000 or 3,000 or more. So you have so many opportunities <laughs> to develop some chips. Hopefully, you know, uh, get our engineers to come out and develop chips. So in terms of manufacturing, uh, we have... I don't know, maybe six or more companies here doing uh, manufacturing of automotive chips in the country. But they are mainly MNCs. Yeah. I think Bosch is one of them, right? Yeah, many, yeah. Companies. Yeah. Many, yeah. Uh, many companies. So, so what should parents know about um, possibly pushing their children to become engineers? Uh, why don't we have more kids submitting you know, their CVs to become engineers in Malaysia? Well, what should they know? about how attractive this industry is. But I think the key thing is that number one, we got to inspire children to be, to have the spirit of inquiry. We got to start them young. We get them involved in science, get them involved in mathematics, and then to create curiosity about what, how and why things happen, you know. Uh, if the children are just user technology and never question anything, then the probability of studying science will be low. So we need to get them to be interested in science first. 
And once they're interested in science, then it opens up a new world of opportunity about where all this, your career, you can build in. All right, so we can show different companies here that have people who have great career that can they can be involved in, or they become entrepreneurs, join a startup, or whatever, you know, or new technology that you can participate in. So uh, I think that's where we got to start. Uh, but it's not only that, we have to educate the parents also, because the parents sometimes think that uh, the money is not there. But actually, if you look at it, actually the money is there, and there are so many. Uh, the money is so. Abundance is there, so I guess. <laughs> this is a, maybe the wrong many time for themselves, but I think they, you know, this so-called work-life balance thing. If you go into the uh, factories or work in the multinational, they'll teach you how to balance your life. If you practice what they tell you, how to practice the work-life balance, you have the quality time, quality life. It's just a matter of having the discipline to practice what you what you uh, they are telling you but sometimes we our people don't so they just keep working without having a break i guess i assume that you yourself personally the yeah. you are very interested in science because otherwise yeah. you wouldn't have been involved for yeah. such a long time yeah. i to me there's only two ways of driving interest in science now Mm-hmm. One is of course personal interest. Yeah. The other one is of course forced interest. Parents tell you, government yeah. tell you. Yeah. I assume in China it's more yeah. the government push the kids, like, right? In America, I'm not so sure. What do you think is the most effective way to drive interest in science? I think the most effective way, as I said just now, is to cultivate this spirit of inquiry. Right. So okay, that's, that's one. Part, okay. Right? Then okay. the second part is you have to get their strengthen their mathematics. Because in science, there's a lot of mathematics. When you, when you have the fear of mathematics, then chances are you will not go into science because you find it difficult. But if you have a strong foundation, then everything seems to be quite easy. All right. And then plus your spirit of inquiry, why, and you start asking why things happen or how things happen, then the interest to pursue is there. And then of course, a lot of them are influenced by their friends. You know, depend on the kind of school activities that you do. You know, if you participate in science club, then you're interested in science. You know, you don't participate, you may or may not be interested. So friends around you too uh, will influence you, including, of course, your parents, uh, you know, wh- whether they want you to go into science or not. Uh, if the parents think that going to science is good, then why not? So the cohort of kids that are going to be at least adept in maths is quite a lot. Now. I mean, mm-hmm. from my experience, mm-hmm. like, the cohort of kids who are good in maths and who have the spirit of inquiry, mm-hmm. that one I'm not so sure because it's either they are personally interested or they, are, they, they, they get a trigger or a series of trigger points to get interested. Yeah. That to me is the hard part. Yeah, that also depends a lot on the teachers as well. Huh? And also, uh, last time when we study science, we have a lot of science lab classes where we try experiments and we say, oh, it didn't work or it worked or what happened when you do something. But nowadays I was told that uh, the number of science lab classes are reduced or not there. So the ability to appreciate what all science is all about is not so straightforward anymore. So that's why we encourage the country to build more science discovery centers. Now today we have three. One is the national science, the other one is uh, petrol science, and then we have Tech Dome Penang. So, but you know, you look at California itself, they have, I don't know, 10 or 20 already just in the whole state. You know, we, we in the whole country, we are three, and yet we call ourselves Silicon Valley of the East. You know what I mean? So, we, 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 need, uh, so we need to put all this to try to encourage more people to go and play. And when they play, then they say, oh, this is very interesting. You know, hopefully that spirit will come back and say, okay, doing this is interesting. I don't know why this is happening. And so if they attend experiments, classes to do things, use their hand, uh, then uh, hopefully the, the spirit will come back. The first thing my understanding is that um, for the school kids and the parents, there's two kinds of schools, all right? There's your national schools and then there's your private schools. Yeah. My assumption is that the private schools have more science labs than the national schools mm-hmm. are for a number of reasons, right? Mm-hmm. For those kids who go through private school, they may or may not return to Malaysia like, because mm-hmm. if they end up in the US or yeah, yeah. whether it's Canada or the UK or whatever, they will end up working there. Mm-hmm. And they're told to stay there for a number of reasons, like, right? Mm-hmm. Pay, exchange rate, mm-hmm. yeah. 
opportunities, religious issues at home, etc., etc. Is that a big problem? I mean, how, how do you see that slippage? Shortage. You know, the uh, based on the reports that we read, we have about uh, 15 to 20 percent of our talents living in the country. Okay, graduates, uh, graduates, or existing supply, graduates, graduates living in the country. After they finish, they look for opportunities elsewhere. Okay, or the other countries look for them, and then we also have people who uh, countries who offer them scholarship. You know, like ASEAN scholar, they all studied in Singapore and so on. And most of the time, they are back to Singapore serving the country. Then you have the other end, the supply, where the number of students studying science and engineering is dropping. Okay, uh, I took over the last five years, we have about 18% drop in engineering. In the E and E engineering is something like 25% drop in terms of uh, students you know, uh, going for the uh, engineering uh, program. Yeah. So on the one hand, you're losing on the, when they graduate, and then on the other hand, your number of students studying uh, science and engineering also dropping. Yeah. So you need, you have a hole on both sides. And so not counting uh, some of the engineers who finish their studies, uh, decide to do something else. Okay, that one, I don't even count. Then on top of that, the industry says that some of our graduates as high as 30 percent do not meet industry requirement. So we have a big problem, okay? Uh, and, and, and so the way to solve all this is you have a short term, medium term and long term. Long term will be the education, you know, we've got to fix so many things along the way. But the short term one is the one that I spoke about, getting foreign students studying in Malaysia, especially in engineering and science, to work in Malaysia if the company wants to hire them. It sounds like there's a huge uh, mountain of what to do? Uh, yes, there is a lot to do, a lot to do. But we got to start piece by piece, lah, piece by piece, and, and we can do it. So, for example, the thirty percent or so engineers who did not get a job, we can retrain them. And we, I did that program, you know, a few years ago, about two hundred engineers. We retrain them and put them back into the industry for interviews, and all of them got hired. So, which means that they could be uh, further developed to strengthen their foundation, to strengthen their communication skill and you know, go for an interview and pass that interview. So it can be done. Earlier you mentioned that NVIDIA had its manufacturing in Taiwan. I think mm. largely it's still mainly Taiwan based, right? Yes, I think so. And the same goes for Taiwan Semiconductor, the TSMC. Uh, TSMC, yeah. TSMC yeah. is the biggest foundry. Correct. So I want to ask you, right? companies like NVIDIA and TSMC and the kind of stuff that they do, how systemic to the country are they? And how much of a matter of national importance are they? Because everybody talks about Taiwan being a flashpoint for the eastern side of this potential conflict that mm-hmm. might even happen uh, in the future, like, right? Um, how much of that trigger point comes from the fact that NVIDIA and TSMC are there? In Taiwan, still, mm-hmm. the US wants to protect. The See, Taiwan is producing something like 60% of the worldwide semiconductor, and they are producing at the very high end, okay, cutting edge. And, and that's what TSMC, TSMC is doing, you know, their advanced packaging, their technology not for fab, down to 5, 3, 2 nanometers. Uh, and then due to the geopolitical tension, they become one of the spotlight on, you know, how does the U- U.S. trying to limit the uh, China ba- uh, based on their concern of national security? So with that, you know that changes the whole landscape of uh, the supply chain because there's a lot of restrictions placed on China uh, from can't buy high tech equipment to cannot uh, what do you call it use the uh, high technology people. Equipment, product, and you cannot ship out of China and things like that. There are so many restrictions. And so they need to find a solution. And one of the solutions, this, Taiwan, Taiwan, uh, this China plus one, also the same for Taiwan. They also need to look for uh, Taiwan plus one, same for the US. They also look for uh, US plus one, and same with Europe. They also look for US plus one. So everybody is looking at how to mitigate risk, okay? And this also came about during the uh, pandemic, during the COVID-19 pandemic, where suddenly you find certain countries were impacted and they couldn't ship the products. So a lot of risk uh, mitigation 
uh, strategies were developed to reduce that risk. And coupled with the uh, geopolitical tension, it became even uh, urgent you know, to, to take care of this. So explain this concept of plus one. Plus one being Taiwan, right? And Taiwan is the extra time show. Taiwan uh, is the plus one. Plus one can be anything plus one, you know. I mean, because of the restriction in China, China need to find a solution, right? So the first thing is that the uh, companies who are building products, especially multinational building products in China, for the rest of the world, they move the products outside of China. They need a plus one somewhere. They can't build it in China. Okay, okay. Manufacturing. Manufacturing. Yeah, okay, then you have the uh, Chinese companies who say, if I build in China, I can't ship to the US or the tariffs now is increased double what they have today. Sure, sure. So they have to set up somewhere else so that they can see whether they can overcome the tariff issue or sell to the rest of the world outside of China. Then outside of China, they can ship. Inside China, they can't ship. If you use talents, BR and uh, US citizen can't work in China on high tech, tech high technology. So they, if I do it outside, I, I can attract talent to do some of this work. Same thing with Taiwan. Huh? Taiwan, because everybody is fearful whether there will be a war or there will be a, a blockage of the logistics. If Taiwan cannot ship their products, then it's a problem. So you have to look at something else. Where, where do I move my products to in case something happens, I can still ship. So it's the same thing with Europe. You cannot all just put everything in Europe and then find that even Europe is uh, affected. Somebody else got to ship. Yeah. So I understand the concept of plus one now, but mm -hmm. because Taiwan is so important and it's doing such advanced stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It seems to me that Taiwan is kind of like the, the golden egg, right? Mm -hmm. The golden egg for the future mm -hmm. where everybody wants what Taiwan mm -hmm. produces, right? Yeah. China thinks, China seems to think it, it owns Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, America seems to think that the Taiwanese government in existence now is on the American side. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So, is it true to say that Taiwan is kind of like the, the one that everybody wants to have on their side? The Taiwan has uh, advanced technology. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One because of there's the applications countries. in military, there's applications in consumer, there's applications in household and all. It's very hard to say which one military, which one consumer, which one, you know. Because a lot of products, same product are used in consumer, same product are used for military. So it all depends on where you yeah, application, application uh, needs. Yeah. So it's very difficult. So that's why uh, semiconductor becomes a, an issue, yeah. right? Because now if you say that this product is going to be used on military, then I'm fearful already. Will my national security be affected? Yeah. Something like that. Now. So this is the issues that uh, everybody have to settle. So from a business standpoint, like how do the companies, how do businesses and entrepreneurs how do they kind of strategize about how to invest for the future? Because they know that, especially in electronics, uh, there's all these global issues that nobody really knows what's happening, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. How does it, of course, association leaders like yourself, yeah. right? How do you how do you all think about what's brewing now? So Malaysia has uh, our prime minister announced that Malaysia is the most neutral and non-aligned country. But they just run grapes. Okay. okay, but. You know, so they welcome US, they welcome China, they welcome anybody that can add value and contribute to the semiconductor industry uh, globally. All right, so we are friendly to both sides, uh, to not just both sides, to Europe, to everybody. And the key thing is to strengthen our own ecosystem and make it robust. Uh, and then we can serve the world. Okay? Because of the growth I explained earlier, everybody wants a piece of that pie. Okay, and not only that, everybody also is worried if I put all the eggs in one basket, then if something happened, I may not be able to ship to my customers. So I got to diversify, mitigate the risk. Mm -hmm. So everyone actually is looking at where do I add my plus one, including Malaysian companies. They also have to look at it. They cannot be all here. They also have to put somewhere, something somewhere else just in case. Okay. Now, of course, you have to be big enough to do that. And you are small, then you, you probably don't have to think about it. But generally, uh, most of the... Uh, Companies are looking at this. So the plus one is basically um, your backup facility. La, you know? you do the commitment when you commit to the customer, you need to ship. Correct. That's basically the you have to supply, right? Otherwise, yes. yeah. the orders stop coming in or they go to right. the competitor, right? So, um, so South China Sea and mm -hmm. Straits of Malacca, mm -hmm. um, those are quite congested, possibly choke points as well. Mm -hmm. um, how, how does the association think about reducing the 
For semiconductor, most of us are the air, not so much the sea. So it is the air that you've got to look at where all the flights are going. Okay, there are some small portion by sea, but generally by air. Yeah. So for the for, so the uh, choke points in like say Suez Canal and all that, you have some those who are by sea, then their throughput time will be longer. Then, then there's a shortage of containers and cost of logistics goes up. Yes, you have that. But generally, for semiconductor, will be at the electronics industry will be by air. So of course you've. Um as you said, you've been in this industry yeah. for 50, 60 years, right? Mm -hmm. You've seen a lot of things. Like you've seen the oil crisis. You've seen at least three or four recessions. You've seen multiple downturns. This is very cyclical, right? Yeah, yes. right? Um, how do you see this current situation today? Mm -hmm. Because other than AI, right? Yeah. Everything is, Malaysia is still lagging behind the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see the current cycle? How do you see the technology? Um, and how are you yourself I think uh, there are a lot of opportunities because as now I said all the plus one those who are coming out from China they or come out from the US or even Taiwan or That's Europe they need to look at where to locate these factories okay and their choices are mainly in ASEAN and I think Malaysia sent a very good chance because of our history of 50 years and experience and uh, ecosystem that we have built and of course uh, so-called neutral and uh, friendly government okay that we have announced and well we've had four in the last three years right <laughs> but this is okay because you look back at it there was no dis major disruption there was no what they call it uh, strike or closure of airport or things like that in fact the transition were all very smooth i think that's show maturity of the country um, but this is the thing that is going to happen right the companies have to look at what is the best way to deliver to their customers. And I see it, this thing will continue. Everybody is looking at the place to uh, build their factories outside of the country. And where the countries provide the best, the most and best competitive advantage is where they want to come. So Malaysia, I think, stands out. We, we are very competitive. So the push factors are there, right? Definitely, the mm -hmm. push factors are there. The pull factors are there because of the demand, yeah. right? So it's down to the companies that are looking for the plus one to mm -hmm. make the choice, right? Yes. So Vietnam, definitely, yeah. right? Singapore, yes. for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Malaysia, for sure. Mm -hmm. Which other countries are in a beauty parade? Well, there are others. Uh, India wants a piece of the cake. Yes, India, yes. Brazil, yes. you know, wants Mexico. They are, you know, in uh, other places in Europe, like. Uh, Poland and Romania and this uh, Eastern countries, they are all vying for it. So, you know, I mean, then we have other countries like Indonesia, Thailand, they are all beginning to look at it to see what can I do to, uh, you know, take a piece of that pie when, when it is growing over the next seven, eight years. And what are the metrics for measuring which country is doing the best to attract this investment? Which are the key uh, metrics? Which are the key metrics? I guess the most of the time, the, the uh, government announced or all those uh, researchers announced the investments, okay, the, the volume of investment in US dollars, okay. But, uh, you know, with uh, Malaysia pushing for the national semiconductor strategy, we want to move up the value chain to go into more complex economy, right? And I'm not sure how you measure that because there's no output to measure. If you go into uh, IC design, then you're producing much higher value in that area. Okay, of course, you have FDI with a fab and then you have advanced packaging. You, are, you need to keep up with the technology, but not everything can be measured. So the only measure most people talk about is uh, capital investment. So you have a wafer fab, then it is huge. You can be 10 to 20 billion US dollars. But if you're talking about uh, others, then factories will be bigger because of capex, but you'll go into Design then it will be not, nothing much. It's all human capital. Yeah. So dollars committed lah. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna switch gears for the last couple of questions, Dr. Sri, and talk about you personally. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you've been you've been working and you continue this, to work, which is I think is amazing. Yeah. Uh, not working lah. I'm just contributing to the country. <laughs> but you're serious lah, right? Yeah, you yeah. need to do this, mm -hmm. and you're, yeah. you're, you're kind of an ambassador for Malaysian mm -hmm. semiconductor, which I think is admirable. A lot of people watches. Yeah. Want to play golf and. 
mm-hmm. like muck around with their lives, right? Not do something mm-hmm. meaningful, like per se, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what are your life lessons? Uh, what are your life what are the three things you tell your thirty-five year old nephew about mm-hmm. how to navigate life? Uh, you have those three things? <laughs> three things how to navigate life. <laughs> I think, first of all, um, to navigate life, we talk about resiliency. Uh. Yeah. Because throughout the whole my whole career until today, you see changes swing. It can be dramatic, can be little, but even the can- pandemic already is a major change. Some people can adapt to it, some people cannot adapt to it. You know, they get into depression, they get into all kinds of things. So that resiliency, I think, is very key. You have to learn how to adapt to changes. And then, you know, bosses come and go. Career is not, a, you know, a, a, a target. It's a whole journey. So that is something you have to recognize. It is a journey. Changes are there. The journey is there. You just have to adapt. And then I think uh, the key thing is to, uh, to set some sort of a goal for yourself to say, okay, how far can you go? You know, I mean, I never even imagined that I would be, you know, a vice president for the Global Assembly Test uh, Factory. I never thought about it. But as you progress, your capacity to do more increases. And it just increases, it just increases. Oh, now I can do that too. You know, last time I only watched people doing it. Now I say, I can also do it. But when you are younger, you may not think that you can do it, but as you acquire the experience and you have the confidence by practicing what, what needs to be done, then uh, you will be uh, able to get to the goals that you're after. Uh, even, yeah. So the first thing is resilience. Yeah. Second thing is don't define your possibilities yeah. for your career, right? Right. The third and final thing? Uh, I said you've got to adapt to change. The changes are adaptability. Uh, adaptability. You have to adapt. Because there are so many things are changing and some people say, I don't like this, I don't like that, but you can't do anything. It's already Sorry. changed. Yeah, You just have to go along and do the best you can with the environment or with the situation. Yeah, yeah. And then if you are down, you must bounce back. Easy basically. to say, right? <laughs> Easy to say, Easy but to say. you have to practice. Uh, you have to practice. Uh, you are down and you should go and get help uh, from friends or from your family members or whatever to give you some advice about how to move forward, you know, not not just in bad times, but also in good times. Yeah, know? COVID yeah. time, a lot of companies, yeah. right? Cash yeah. flow dried up. That's right. Then oh. you have to seek help and see what to do and, and see how to, you know, hang on without, uh, you know, closing down your business or whatever. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs>